Welcome everyone to this EU Settlement Scheme training on working with the homeless. I'm Bella, Joint CEO of Here for Good and also an immigration lawyer. And I'm Carla, I'm Here for Good Volunteer Coordinator. I'm, an, I'm also an immigration lawyer based at Byman. So firstly, an introduction to Here for Good. For those of you who do not know, Here for Good is a legal charity which exists to provide free immigration advice to EU, EEA and Swiss citizens and their family members living in the UK. We primarily assist those most in need of free immigration advice, such as the homeless, victims of domestic violence and trafficking, people with complex needs and people living in financial hardship. Our services include an email and telephone advice line, complex casework done by our members and staff, and we also have a network of volunteer lawyers who are taking on complex cases across the UK. An introduction to this training program. This training is commissioned by the Greater London Authority and delivered by us at Here for Good. We are conducting 16 EU settlement scheme training sessions between June and October 2020. These include this specific training on working with the homeless, as well as other specific trainings and also an overview of complex cases training. This training is designed for OISC Level 1 advisors, OISC Level 2 or 3 advisors who do not regularly advise on the EU settlement scheme, and also individuals providing frontline support to vulnerable persons. It's worth noting that this training is not designed to replace official OISC training, and also that while Carla and I are experts in immigration law, we are not experts in immigration regulation. Therefore, if you are OISC accredited but unsure of what work you can do at your level, we would recommend contacting OISC directly. The contact details of OISC and also other regulators are provided in our training manual, which will be sent to you after this session. I'm now going to pass you over to Carla, who will discuss the training objectives for today. Thank you, Beth. So the aims of this training for today are two basically main objectives. The first one is to provide you with an overview of the main issues you may encounter when assisting homeless people to apply under the scheme. And secondly, we will also provide you with practical tips in order to best support homeless people with their applications under the EU settlement scheme. The structure of this training. So we will first give you, give you a brief overview of the EU settlement scheme. We will then discuss common issues that arise in cases involving homeless people. We will then discuss together some case studies, and finally, we will then give you some time for a Q&A. So before we go into the main section of this training, we're just going to give you a brief overview of the EU settlement scheme. We are aware that some of you may have already have a good understanding of the information covered in this section. However, as we have people of different levels of experience attending, we think it may be beneficial for some of you to have a refresher of the EU settlement scheme. This brief overview will cover the legal background and framework, who needs to apply under the EU settlement scheme, the relevant deadlines, key requirements for settled status, and an overview of the application process. I should note that section one to two of the training manual, which will be provided after the session, give a much more detailed overview of the EU settlement scheme. They also provide a step-by-step -step guide to the application process. Please therefore refer to these sections of the manual after the session if you need to familiarize yourself further. So firstly, we're going to look at the legal background and framework behind the EU settlement scheme. So the legal background, as we all know, is essentially Brexit. On the 31st of January 2020, the UK officially left the EU, and the withdrawal agreement between the UK and EU was implemented into UK law as the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act. As we all know, the UK is currently in a transition period, which is due to last until the end of this year, the 31st of December 2020. From the 1st of January 2021, as far as we understand, a new points-based immigration system will apply. To understand the EU settlement scheme, it is important to be aware of both EU law and domestic law. Under EU law, the rights of EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members come from something known as the Free Movement Directive. The Free Movement Directive was implemented into domestic law as the Immigration EEA Regulations 2016. As a result of the withdrawal agreement, Appendix EU was implemented under UK law, 
Appendix EU is the legal framework behind the EU settlement scheme. Currently, these legal frameworks coexist. However, the EEA regulations will be repealed, most likely at the end of this year. It is important to note that this will directly affect those applicants who cannot apply under the EU settlement scheme until they have been granted a document under the EEA regulations. We will discuss this more later on. So, in terms of the EEA regulations, it is good to have at least a basic understanding of these. As you may know, under the regulations, an EU, EA or Swiss citizen has an initial right to reside in the UK for three months. To continue to reside, they will then need to be considered a qualified person. To be a qualified person under EU law, you must be exercising treaty rights, which includes working, studying, being self-employed, being self-sufficient and looking for work. After five years of exercising treaty rights, a person will automatically acquire the right of permanent residence under EU law in the UK. Under the regulations, EU citizens can also have certain family members join them. There are various different documents which you can apply for to confirm your rights under EU law. These will be discussed later on. And as I just noted, Due to Brexit, all of these documents will cease to be valid after the 31st December 2020. Those who hold them must therefore still apply under the EU settlement scheme. So now looking at Appendix EU, as noted, Appendix EU has been developed as part of the withdrawal agreement. Appendix EU is the legal framework for the EU settlement scheme. As we all know, the EU settlement scheme is a mechanism through which EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members can apply to secure their rights in the UK. At present, this run, runs parallel to those EEA regulations 2016. As I'm sure you're all aware, there are two types of status that can be granted under the scheme. These include indefinite leave to remain, also known as settled status, for those who have lived in the UK for five years or more and limited leave to remain, also known as pre-settled status, for those who have lived in the UK for less than five years. So what is the difference between the EEA regulations and Appendix EU? So the main difference between these is that under the EU settlement scheme, the main requirement is residence in the UK. There is no need to demonstrate that the applicant has been exercising treaty rights. The applicant just needs to have been resident in the UK. It is also worth noting that under the EEA regulations, the right to reside is acquired automatically, whereas you must apply for status under the EU settlement scheme in order to obtain residency rights. This next slide shows the different documents issued under the EEA regulations and the EU settlement scheme. It is important you're aware of the documents issued under the EEA regulations, as you may come across people with them in your work and as discussed later, they are required for some EU settlement scheme applications. Also, due to Brexit, as I've noted, these documents will cease to apply after the end of this year. Those of these documents must therefore apply under the EU settlement scheme. Um, this table is also provided in our comprehensive training manual, so you can refer to it later on if you need to. So now we're briefly going to discuss who must apply under the EU settlement scheme. So, as I'm sure you know, EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members need to apply under the scheme. This includes people who have been issued with documents under the EA regulations, even if, for example, they've been issued with a permanent residence document. Exceptions to who need to apply under the scheme include Irish citizens, British citizens, including those who have dual citizenship, and individuals who have already been granted indefinite leave to remain or indefinite leave to enter under the UK immigration rules. So on that last point, on individuals who have been granted indefinite leave to remain or indefinite leave to enter under the UK immigration rules, it's worth noting that while they do not have to apply under the scheme, they may want to do so. This is because if they apply for settled status, they will receive an up-to-date proof of their status. They will have better family reunion rights in which status under the EU settlement scheme is required. They will be permitted to leave the UK for five years without losing their indefinite leave to remain status, 
whereas if you have indefinite leave to remain issued under the UK immigration rules, you will lose your status after two years of consecutive absence from the UK, and they will avoid the potential consequences of being unable to easily evidence their right to reside in the future, as we all saw with the Windrush scandal. In terms of non-EA family members, there are two categories who qualify under the EU settlement scheme, direct family members and extended family members. In terms of direct family members, you have as shown on the table, spouse, civil partners, direct descendants under 21, so for example, children or grandchildren under 21, dependent children over 21, and dependent persons in the ascending line, so for example, dependent parents or grandparents. In terms of extended family members, we have the group shown on this table, which includes durable partners. So that's unmarried partners, usually those who have lived together for two years, and other types of dependent relatives or members of the household in need of the EEA citizen's care. The primary difference between direct and extended family members that is important for you to know about the purposes of the EU settlement scheme is that extended family members have to hold a document issued under the EU regulations in order to apply under the scheme. There are other categories of non-EA citizen family members who may also be able to apply under the EU settlement scheme, including those with certain types of complex cases. Um, these will be covered by me later in the, on in the training. And I'm now going to pass you on to Carla, who's going to discuss deadlines. Thank you, Thank Bella. You. I'm just going to become, uh, make myself present a second. Okay, great. Thank you. So the deadlines under the EU settlement scheme. The main deadline is the 30th of June 2021, which is the end of the grace period. This is except for a few cases. And this deadline applies to applicants who are resident in the UK by the 31st of December 2020, which is the end of the grace, uh, sorry, the end of the transition period. That means that the, at the moment there is some time pressure for certain groups of applicants who have to apply first under the EEA regulation 2016. So, um, as Bella described earlier, extended family members like durable partners, they must hold first a residence card issued under the EA regulations before they can apply under the EU settlement scheme. Therefore, for this group of applicants, there's now time pressure to apply before the end of this year because the EA regulations will be repealed by the end of this year. Now we're going to go through the key requirements to apply for settler status. The key requirements are as follows. First one, it would be five years continuous residence in the UK. Secondly, the no supervening, no supervening event has occurred in the case. And thirdly, the applicant must meet all the eligibility and also the suitability requirements. Now, continuous residence means that the applicant cannot be outside the UK for more than six months in any 12-month period of the five years qualifying period. This becomes very important for those who have pre-settled status. But if in the future they want to upgrade to settler status, they need to take into consideration the maximum permitted absences for each 12-month period. Although this is the general rule, there are some exceptions. For example, when there is a single period of absence of more than six months, but which does not exceed 12 months. And because the, the, the absence has happened for an important reason, such as study, childbirth, or vocational training. The no supervening event has occurred is another requirement to apply under the EU settlement scheme. The Home Office defines supervening event in Appendix EU as follows. First, a period of absence from the UK of more than five years or, or four years if a Swiss citizen, since they last acquired the right of permanent residence in the UK, whether they have applied for the document or, or settled status. It's also a supervening event when the applicant has been issued with an exclusion or deportation or order under the regulations or other than under the regulations, meaning um, under the immigration um, uh, domestic legislation and not under EU law. Suitability requirements. We said earlier that another key requirement under the EU settlement scheme is for applicants to meet all the eligibility but also the suitability requirements. 
Now, those are considered in Appendix EU15, which are the mandatory grounds of refusal, and EU16, which are the discretionary grounds of refusal. We are going to discuss about this more about the mandatory and uh, grounded refusal a bit later on in the training. Overview of the application process. Well, we're going to give you now a very quick overview because we, we understand that most of you might be familiarized already with the application process, but just as a refresher. So there are three main checks in all USS applications. First check is to check the applicant's identity and nationality checking. This, for those who have a biometric passport or ID or have also a biometric um, residence card, can be done on the phone. Otherwise, it can be done the application online, and then the applicant can send their passport um, or their, resi uh, yeah, their passport or ID to the home office. Or otherwise, those who do not have identity or nationality documents, they can request a paper application form. Now, the second check is the resident checking which is done automatically through the Home Office checking um, applicants' HMRC and DWP records. And thirdly, the criminality checking. The identity and nationality checking, as I just mentioned, for those who have um, valid passport or national identity card, uh, that should be enough. Europeans need those, need those documents, so passport or national identity card, but non-EA EA family members they can also provide their biometric residence cards issued under the um, EA regulations 2016. As explained, for those who have a biometric uh, relevant document, they can apply using the EU Exit ID Document Check mobile app, which is available for iPhone and some iPhone and Android phones. For those who, do, who have a document that is biometric but do not have the technology required to scan the passport, for example, they don't have one of these phones who accept this mobile app, they can also go to one of the locations offered by the Home Office to do document scanning. If for those who do not have passport or ID, which is biometric, they can complete the application online and they can also post the passport or ID to the Home Office. And there is an extra requirement for non-EA family members, which is also as part of the application process, to book a appointment with Soprasteria to enroll the biometric. Resident checking, as um, I said earlier, is automatically confirmed by the Home Office by checking applicants' HMRC and DWP records. However, if those records do not show a continuous residence of five years and the applicant uh, confirms to you that they have been living in the UK for five years or more, there's also a possibility that they can also upload documentary evidence to show the residence in the UK. It's worth noting that there is some preferred, alternative, and unacceptable evidence, and you can find that a list of what is um, in each category in Annex A of the Home Office guidance. Criminality checking. Well, applicants who are age 18 or over are all required to disclose the criminal records, and the problem is that failure to do so might potentially trigger refusal on grounds of deception. In any event, all applications are also subject to checks against the Police National Computer, the Warning Index, and also overseas criminal records checks. That means, eventually, that some people with criminal records might be turned down for settled or pre-settled status as a result of that criminality checking and on grounds of suitability. Paper application form is, a, is another route in which applicants can also apply under the EU settlement scheme. Paper application form normally applies for European citizens or family members who do not have a valid ID or passport, and also for some non-European family members who are applying under specific categories, and those are surrender thing, derivative right of residence, and also family members of dual citizens, also called as loans case. Um, they will, in those cases, those who fall under one of these categories and need to apply under paper application form, they can call the EU Resolution Centre and basically ask for a personalised application paper form, and then they will have to complete it, put all the documents together and post it to the Home Office. Processing times. The latest guidance, which is published, I believe, in May 2020, 
says that it takes around five working days for a straightforward application to be processed, but it can actually take up to a month. Processing can take longer than one month, according to the guidance, if, for example, further information is requested, the applicant is a minor and the application is not linked to an adult, the applicant has applied through a paper application form, the applicant has criminal records, or we're talking about a non-EA family member who is applying based on a relationship that they have never relied before on a previous application with the Home Office. Even though the guidance stipulates these specific processing times, in practice, we are seeing like major delays under the EU settlement scheme. Now, if the delay is longer than six months, it might be possible to challenge it via a judicial mechanism called judicial review. And prior to that, um, solicitors will normally prepare a pre-action protocol letter, setting out why this delay could be unreasonable, unlawful in the case, and what's the detriment that is causing to the applicant. That means that not all delays might be challengeable, but if you experience, if you have a client who has been experiencing a massive delay for at least more than six months, and they are suffering a detriment as a result, and they're struggling, and there is no reason why the application should be delayed, it might be possible to challenge it. Um, it might be that you don't have the accreditation um, to do this type of work, but you could also refer to a more senior immigration advisor or um, to other charities who might be able to help. At Here for Good, we have some capacity sometimes for challenging delays, so feel free to also reach us um, in case you have a client in this situation. Well, getting a decision. So this is normally what happens at the end of all the applications, uh, at the end of the application process. Normally, the application is approved, and in those cases, the applicant will receive a letter by email confirming that the application has been approved, or if they have applied by post, they will receive a letter by post. Now, this letter or email that they receive is not proof of the immigration status. That means the applicants need to view and prove their rights in the UK of settled or pre-settled status online. And this is because the EU settlement scheme is a digital system and applicants are not given physical proof of their immigration status in the UK unless they are non-EA family members. So those non-EA family members without already BRPs issued under the regulations are the only category of applicants that are actually given uh, a residence card under the EU settlement scheme. So, because we're talking about a digital system and the importance of viewing and proving your rights online, it's also same important to keep updating details. So, all the details provided when the applicant applied, such as a phone number, the email address, the home address, and the passport number. If any of those details change, it's important to update the home office, and this can be done quite easily online. Now, in certain instances, applications may be refused. Now, there are a few remedies against those refusals. There is a right of appeal for those applicants who made an application on or after 11 p.m. on Brexit Day on the 31st of January 2020. And for those who applied before, they do not have a right of appeal. However, they still can, have, they still can lodge an administrative review. This applies to those who appeal on or after or before Brexit Day. And in any event, before the deadline, all applicants can also submit fresh applications. Losing a status. So this is a common question that sometimes people ask us. Is it possible for someone who has been granted settled status to lose it in the future? What are the situations that can trigger such, such a thing? So, Basically, uh, in terms of losing a status, those who have been granted settler status might lose that settler status if they spent abroad consecutively more than five years after they've been granted settler status. Again, four consecutive years for Swiss citizens. And also quite importantly, subsequent criminal offending, so future criminal offending, might also lead to a revocation of indefinite remain or settler status in the future. For those, <clears throat> for those granted pre-settler status, they can lose automatically the right of pre-settler status for absences of more than two consecutive years. 
However, be very careful because even though they can leave the UK for up to two years without losing pre-settled status, the absence might actually jeopardize the ability to actually then upgrade to settled status because for, for them to apply for settled status, as we con um, said earlier, they must be in the UK at least six months in any 12 month period of the five years qualifying period. Pre-settled status can also be automatically lost if it's not converted, if it's not converted or upgraded into settler status before the expiry date of the pre-settler status decision. Okay, so I'm gonna pass on to Bella now, who's going to start talking about the core issue of the training today, which is working with homeless. Great, thank you, Carla. So moving on to the core issue today, which is working with the homeless. So, Carla and I are going to take you through the common issues that here for good often find a rise in EU settlement scheme cases involving homeless people and discuss how we suggest you should tackle these issues. So as you can see on the slide, these common issues include lack of valid ID, lack of residence evidence, digital exclusion and criminal convictions and removal decisions. So looking at the first common issue, which is lack of valid ID, Often homeless people do not hold a valid ID as required by the scheme. For example, we often find that their ID has been lost or stolen while they have been rough sleeping. Now, the Home Office EU Settlement Scheme Caseworker Guidance accepts that there may be some limited cases where an applicant is unable to obtain a valid ID due to circumstances beyond their control or other compelling practical or compassionate reasons. In such cases, an applicant must apply using a paper application form and alternative evidence of their identity. So there are several suggested steps that we say you should take when you find out that an applicant you are assisting has no valid ID. These are that you first ensure that all reasonable steps are taken to obtain a valid ID. Second, if it is not possible to obtain a valid ID, you should identify the reason why the applicant is unable to obtain one. Third, you should then assist the applicant to gather alternative evidence of their identity or nationality. Fourth, you should request a paper application form from the Settlement Resolution Centre and if possible, you should also prepare detailed legal representations about this issue. So step one, ensure that all reasonable steps are taken to obtain the valid ID. Now, there are two reasons why this is important. Firstly, where possible, it is preferable for the applicant to have a valid ID as it will make it easier for them to demonstrate their rights in the long term. For context, if an EU citizen applies without a valid ID, their digital status granted under the scheme will be connected to a six-digit application number provided in their acceptance letter. Every time they want to prove their status, they will need to use that six-digit number to log on to the online system. In our experience of working with the homeless, and as Carla will discuss later on when she covers the issue of digital exclusion, vulnerable applicants often already find having a digital status very challenging. It is therefore more practical and reassuring for an EA citizen to at least have their digital immigration status linked to a physical ID document, such as a passport, rather than a random application number. They may also benefit from having a valid ID as it may facilitate their access to public services. Secondly, in cases where no valid ID can be obtained, it is important to be able to demonstrate to the Home Office that reasonable steps have been taken to get one. This is to justify the use of a paper form and alternative evidence of identity. So, in terms of the steps you should take, if the applicant's ID has been lost or stolen, you should ensure that this is reported to the police and national authority. Where needed, you can assist the applicant to do this. You should also make inquiries with their embassy or consulate to find out whether it is possible to make an emergency appointment and obtain a fee exemption, what information, consent and documents are required, and the time frame to obtain a new ID. Also, an important tip is that you should make sure that you keep evidence and a record of all the steps that are taken to obtain a valid ID, as these may be needed in support of the application. It is sometimes possible to make an emergency appointment on the applicant's behalf as a charity in order to expedite the regular appointment process. It is often helpful to accompany the client to their appointment. 
in some cases, you may also be able to request a fee exemption due to the client's destitution. However, not all consulates or embassies will provide emergency appointments or fee exemptions. They tend to make exceptions only on a case-by-case basis, so preventing the particular difficult circumstances of the applicant is crucial. If you are not able to obtain a fee exemption, you may need to secure funds to pay fees and related costs, such as passport photos. It is also worth seeing if there are any exceptions available on the supporting documents required to obtain a new passport or ID. For example, using a referee to confirm identity might be possible in some cases. In other cases, this may not be possible and it might be helpful to support the client to contact their family members in their home country to get birth certificates or other documents required. If, however, you find it is not possible for the applicant to obtain a valid ID, you should move on to step two, which is to identify the reason the applicant is unable to obtain a valid ID and obtain evidence in relation to it. You should bear in mind the Home Office guidance when doing so. So, as discussed earlier, the reasons they permit include circumstances beyond the applicant's control and compelling and compassionate circumstances. In their guidance, the Home Office gives some specific examples of situations that may prevent an applicant from obtaining a valid ID, such as if the applicant has a medical condition which makes it impossible or unreasonable for them to obtain a new ID. If the applicant's situation does fall into one of these specific examples provided in the guidance, you should ensure you provide the evidence that the Home Office guidance suggests in relation to these, such as a letter from their GP. If it does not, you should still ensure you provide evidence of the difficulties the applicant has faced in obtaining an ID, such as evidence of communication with the consulate or embassy, and evidence of the applicant's compelling or compassionate circumstances, such as a letter from a homeless charity or organisation supporting them, which outlines their situation. Step three is to gather alternative evidence of identity and nationality. The Home Office has a non-exhaustive list of alternative evidence of identity that can be provided. This is also set out in our training manual that will be sent to you after this session. This includes items such as an expired passport. You should refer to this list and help the applicant to gather alternative evidence of their identity and nationality. Step four is to request a paper application form from the Settlement Resolution Centre. You do this by calling the Settlement Resolution Centre. You will need to provide the applicant's details when you make this call. Also, it is usually best in cases involving homeless people to provide your professional address for the Settlement Resolution Centre to send the paper application form to. Finally, step five is that If possible, you should prepare legal representations to accompany the application. In relation to the lack of valid ID issue, these should note the steps that have been taken to obtain a valid ID, the reasons it was not possible to obtain this, and why alternative evidence of identity should be accepted, with reference to the Home Office's guidance and any supporting evidence you have provided, such as a letter of support from a homeless charity and evidence of correspondence with the embassy or consulate. If you do not feel able to draft these representations, you can refer the case onto a more senior immigration advisor. So another issue we commonly come across in cases involving homeless people is lack of residence evidence. The main way in which the Home Office checks whether an applicant has been resident in the UK, as Carla noted earlier, is through their automatic checks with HMRC and DWP. In many cases where the applicant is homeless, the Home Office will not be able to confirm the applicant's residence in the UK using only the automatic checks, as they may have not been working or in receipt of benefits. It is very important to note that if an applicant has been living in the UK for five years or more, you should assist them to apply for settled status, not pre-settled status. This is the case even if you are unable to obtain evidence of their residence for the full five-year period. 
This is because settled status is a more secure form of immigration status that may allow an applicant easier access to benefits and public services. This can be life-changing in some situations, particularly when working with homeless and vulnerable applicants. The steps we suggest you take, therefore, with regards to a lack of residence evidence are First, take all possible steps to obtain evidence of residence for the full five-year period. And second, if it is not possible to obtain evidence for the full five-year period, submit an application for settled status with detailed legal representations regarding the lack of evidence of residence issue. So, in relation to step one, that is, obtaining as much evidence of residence as possible for the five-year period. It is usually useful to ask the applicant if they have been registered with the GP or received medical support in the UK. If so, you can request a letter from their GP or their medical records, both of which can serve as evidence of their residence in the UK. And if the applicant is being assisted by a homeless or support organisation, you can also get a letter of support from them confirming the period they have been in contact with or supporting the applicant and the period they have known the applicant to be resident in the UK. And finally, you can obtain the applicant's combined homeless and information network known as CHAIN records, which I will talk about in the next slide. It is worth noting that this is definitely not an exhaustive list. It is just examples of residence evidence we often find particularly useful in cases involving homeless persons. It is always worth asking the applicant about their situation to see what evidence of their residence they may have. For example, you should ask if they have a bank account, in which case you could request their bank statements and this would serve as evidence of their residence in the UK. Also, in terms of a practical tip, it is useful to note that when requesting records on behalf of an applicant, such as medical records or a letter from their GP, you will need to provide a signed form of authority from the applicant. So, in terms of chain records, chain is a multi-agency database recording information about rough sleepers and the wider street population in London. It is commissioned and funded by the GLA and managed by an organisation called St Mungo's and it represents the UK's most detailed and comprehensive source of information about rough sleeping. A number of homeless charities are part of CHAIN and will record any contact they have with a rough sleeper on this database. If you therefore know there is a homeless charity supporting the applicant, it is worth asking them directly if they have access to their chain records and can provide you with them. Otherwise, you can request their chain records from St Mungo's by emailing chainhelpdesk at stmungos.org and for more information on this, you can visit the website which you can see the link of on the slide. Chain records are a really useful way to be able to demonstrate that a homeless person has been resident in the UK, particularly when they lack any other official documentation. So, step two. In cases where you have tried all the possible options but are still unable to obtain evidence of residence for the full five-year period, you should still assist the applicant to apply for settled status and write detailed representations in support of their application. These representations should set out the reasons the applicant is eligible for settled status, the reasons they should be granted settled status despite their lack of residence evidence, any particular compelling circumstances that mean the applicant is unable to obtain evidence of their residence for a certain period, and they should note any steps that have been taken to try and obtain evidence of residence and the supporting evidence that is able to be provided. It is worth noting here that Here for Good have had several successful cases where we had very limited evidence of the applicant's residence in the UK, but we submitted detailed legal representations and often a letter of support from the homeless charity or charities that have been working with the applicant. 
Please therefore make sure you refer on cases to a more senior immigration advisor if you feel unable to write these detailed legal representations and the applicant does not have evidence of their residence for the full five-year period but is eligible for settled status. Okay, so I think I'm now going to pass you on to Carla, who is going to take you through the next two issues, including digital exclusion and criminal convictions and removal decisions. Okay, so talking about common issues, more common, other common issues that we encounter by, with um, when we help homeless individuals is digital exclusion. So we found this topic massive when it comes to, to helping homeless individuals. And this is because most homeless in applicants that we encounter, at least, might struggle with accessing online applications. They might not have also the resources to scan documents that they need to provide to the Home Office. They will struggle, in many cases, completing online applications. And that might be because of um, language barriers, because of mental health issues, etc. They might also struggle uh, very often with having an email address, setting up and also maintaining an email address, remembering the passwords, etc. And overall in understanding how to use the online service to access the digital status under the EU settlement scheme in the future. So we consider loads of homeless applicants fall under digital exclusion because of all of these reasons. Now, in those cases, what we recommend is that you provide basically the, the applicant that you're supporting with very clear information. So you need to tell them that this is a digital system and you need to guide them through the whole application process. You might need to do it for them, or even though it's good for them to also be involved so that they understand what they're doing. And then you will need to assist them with setting up an email address for them, um, helping them to do the scanning of their passport and ID and complete the online application, as well as scanning and uploading documents. Now, this is, sorry, I'm going back one slide. This is exactly what you will do whilst you are helping the individual. But then it, this is important, that helps, but even more important is to explain them what will happen after they receive a decision and how to move on forward. So they need to understand that they need to be one proof they write online. They're not going to get, if they're EU nationals, a proof of a, a physical proof of their status, so they need to learn how to view and prove online their rights. And that sometimes takes like a few appointments with the, um, with the applicant. It takes you as well to possibly draft a step-by-step -step guide explaining in simple language what are the steps, because it's very important that those who are in this situation know how to access their status, especially because that might allow them then to access benefits and other health care, et cetera, that will be very needed in those cases. So it will be also very important to make them understand that they need to keep their status updated. And again, that could be very tricky with those who are homeless individuals because they might change accommodation very often and as much as they can, they should update the home office every time they change accommodation. And also they might change phones and emails very often. We see that again. So this, all of that needs to be very clear in their mind that as much as they can, they should update it to the, with the home office. Otherwise, they might have to travel, or they will, for sure, if they change email or phone, they will struggle to then access their online status when they need to do so. So, yeah, we suggest then that you possibly draft a very, like, simple step-by-step -step guide on how to use an email first, prove their status, and update their personal details. The decision letter issued by the Home Office does explain how to do the, how to prove your rights and update, but in a very not in a comprehensive language for someone who might be vulnerable. So it would be necessary that you um, do all of that for them, actually. Now, a useful tip, and we do that very often, in some circumstances, it might be much easier if you link the homeless person's application to your professional email address whilst making the application, of course, just throughout the application process. And this is for, for obvious reasons. Um, you might receive correspondence by the Home Office uh, requesting you to submit further evidence or requesting information about a criminal conviction, etc. So, and very often homeless applicants, because of their lifestyle sometimes, and sometimes like other issues like mental health issues, etc., they might not check their email, they might forget their email password, and they might miss any email coming from the Home Office. So, and also it might be very difficult sometimes even establish communication with, um, with the homeless individual uh, for days. You might not find them, et cetera. So 
the best thing and we, we will no, what we normally do is we link the homeless person's application to your professional email address up until a decision is reached. And then you, of course, will need to liaise with the applicant, go and see him or her in person and update the details with their own addresses. Okay, so the fourth common issue that we encounter with supporting homeless persons are the criminal, the, the fact that sometimes they might have criminal convictions and also removal um, or deportation decisions in force. Now, as we explained at the beginning of the training, applicants over the age of 18 are required to declare criminal convictions that appear in the criminal records in the UK or overseas. However, they don't have to apply, they, they don't have to um, declare um, spent convictions, warnings or cautions, or alternatives to prosecution. The practical problem that we encounter is that many times homeless individuals will not remember, will not know the extent of the criminal records. I have encountered many applicants that they tell me that they don't have any criminal records, they've been arrested once, and then when I request a PNC um, records, I find out that they have loads of criminal convictions and loads of like minor offenses. So it's important that they know exactly what the criminal history is because there are certain questions in the application form that they need to complete correctly. And why is that is because, as we said earlier, failure to disclose might lead to a refusal on grounds of deception on suitability grounds. Now, when it comes to the lack of knowledge of criminal records, that should be very easily resolved if you help the applicant to obtain the, um, uh, the, the records hold, held in the police national computer. And you do that through a mechanism called a subject access request to the criminal records uh, office, ACRO. So you basically um, do that request, you can do that online. And in our experience, it's quicker and easier if you do it online. Um, you can do it by post as well, but um, it takes much longer. So to make this subject access request to the criminal records office to get a copy of the PNC records of the applicant, you need a few things. First, you need proof of identity of the applicant, such as driving license, passport, or national identity card. And if the applicant does not have any of the above documents, and it happens quite often sometimes, they will need to provide other documentation to prove also their identity, uh, full name, and date of birth. Secondly, you will need to show, you will need to explain in the, in the office, uh, in, sorry, in the application form, the address history of the applicant for the last 10 years, okay? Including from what date to what date they live at a specific address. Now, as a useful tip, if the applicant cannot recall all the addresses of all the dates that they lived in those addresses, they can just state one address, for example, the current address, and it could be the temporary accommodation where they're staying right now, and explain that they cannot remember this information in a box at the end of the application form. It's important that you kind of complete that step in the subject access request, because if you don't disclose 10 years, you cannot move on to the next step of the application process. So um, it's as easy as declaring that the person has lived for 10 years in the current address and then explaining in a, a box that you will be provided at the end of the application form that, um, that the situation that the client cannot remember and that they've been living here for X amount of years and, and that's it. And you should be fine with it all the time. Um, if you submit the request online, you must provide a valid email address. As we said earlier, if you are helping the applicant directly, you might want to provide your own email address so that you receive the PNC records directly to your email. And um, if, of course, the client consents you to do so, all of that you will need to do with their consent or with a letter, um, letter of authority signed by the applicant. Um, just as a useful tip again, the online form will time out after 60 minutes of an activity and all data will be deleted. So if you take in some time, you will need to then redo the application. And this request is completely free and normally you should receive the criminal records of the applicant within 30 days. Okay, another issue we encounter when it comes to criminality, et cetera, is sometimes um, applicants, when they apply, and they submit the evidence uh, of the residence, et cetera, if necessary. They might then receive an email directly to the email if they um, impute the email or to your email if you're helping them directly um, with this kind of information. So um, the Home Office sent an email to the applicant explaining that uh, basically from the information available to in the PMC record, they think that um, there is an ongoing police investigation 
or a prosecution in relation to, for example, here we just put destroy or damage property as an example. And they will also tell you which is the police force that is actually handling this matter. In this case, was the Metropolitan Police. Um, and then, and most importantly, the Home Office will tell you that because of this ongoing police investigation or prosecution, they are unable to progress your application until this matter is concluded. And then they tell you that to allow time for that to happen, we will check police records for an update in six months. Okay? Then it says, very importantly, in the email that you will receive, in this if this matter concludes sooner, or if you believe that it has already concluded, but police records have not yet been updated, you must confirm with the police when the records will be updated. When you have done that, you can contact the Settlement Resolution Center to ask us to progress your application. So it's very important that you read the email carefully and that you actually follow those steps because it happens very often that applicants get that email because it says that it's going to be paused for six months. The, the, the Home Office will not look at this application again in the next six months. But in the meantime, perhaps a month after the email has been received, actually the police have updated their police national computer and they have basically stopped any investigation and the, 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 the ongoing police investigation has now concluded with no further action and they have now updated the PNC. But unless you actually actively call the police and ask them whether this update has been happening or whether this ongoing police investigation still continues, you know, unless you do the investigation of what is happening, all the applicant will find is that the application will be pending for six months. So you might want to help the applicant to speed up the application process by making inquiries with the police and finding out whether um, this is still ongoing or it's now concluded or it's no further action has happened. And then, of course, after you get the confirmation from the police, then you call the resolution center to inform them that they should run a check against the police national computer sooner than six months because there's nothing now pending against the applicant. Okay, so just again, another useful tip that we encounter many times. Um, and basically, in this slide, explain you again what I just told you. So it is possible that the PNC automatic check shows that the applicant is subject to a pending police investigation or prosecution. Um, the Home Office will put the application on hold for six months. To find out whether police investigation is still ongoing, please call the Metropolitan Police. That was in this example where um, the person was required, the, the person knew that the case was handled by the Metropolitan Police and then speak with the officer in charge, of course, to understand what is happening. And then if the police confirm that there is nothing pending against the applicant anymore, then call back the resolution center and update them. And again, as I said, that will really help to progress the applicant's application because the Home Office will then run a fresh, fresh check against the PNC instead of waiting for these six months to do so. Referral to immigration enforcement is, again, something that you might encounter in cases involving homeless individuals. So from the information provided um, by the applicant or, and as well by the checks uh, carried out automatically with the PNC and the warning index, an applicant might be referred to immigration enforcement team for full consideration of their conduct and whether, because of their criminal convictions, they might, uh, deportation proceedings might be issued against them. Okay? So, in this case, in case that the Home Office decides that because of the criminality, the immigration enforcement should make an assessment to whether this person should be now uh, subject to a deportation order, if that happened, if that immigration referral happened, and if the Home Office actually believes that deportation proceedings should be uh, correct in this case, then the applicant will be contacted and invited to submit representations uh, as to why they should not be deported or excluded. Now, this type of work will might be outside your, the scope of work that you can do under the EU settlement scheme, because this is actually challenging deportation, a deportation order, making representations challenging that. And a deportation order is a very, very serious matter. So you might need to refer to a more senior immigration advisor if that happens. Okay? Which applicants must be referred to immigration enforcement? So these immigration enforcement referrals will happen automatically if any of these points in this slide happen in the case. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of them now because it's all in the training materials and in the slides. And, but basically, for example, if someone tells you that they had a sentence of imprisonment within the last five years, that case will be referred to immigration enforcement for a consideration to whether the protection proceedings are 
um, viable in that case. Or, for example, when someone has a custodial sentence of 12 months or more for a single offence, or residents in the UK for, the la for less than three years, if in the last three years they received three or more convictions, so a persistent offender. So, in these type of cases, the, 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 the USS application will be referred to immigration enforcement. Now, um, this slide is talking a little bit about deportation. It's very complex area of law deportation, and I'm not going to go on uh, in any detail now. But just for you to know, so where the relevant test for deportation, so when the case has then been referred to immigration enforcement, and then immigration enforcement, what they will look is the criminality of the person or the circumstances, and whether um, the relevant test for deportation is met or is not met in the case. Okay. So if the relevant test for deportation is met, the Home Office then, as I said, will inform the applicant of the deportation or exclusion decision and will then issue a separate letter from the USS based on that decision that will need to be challenged if the applicant wishes to challenge the deportation proceedings. Okay? Now, where the relevant test for deportation or exclusion is not met, all will happen is that the immigration enforcement team will return then the application to other caseworker team, and the applicant will then be granted um, status under the EU settlement scheme. Okay? The problem with referrals to immigration enforcement is that you don't get notified and the applicant do not get notified. Okay? We don't know when cases have been referred to immigration enforcement, but you can suspect that if sometimes cases involving serious criminality or some criminality have been pending for a while, it might be because it's look, um, immigration enforcement is actually looking at whether um, the relevant test for deportation could be met in that case, could be met in that case. Now, um, refusals on grounds of suitability can happen as well. So, applicants with criminal records are often very anxious and about the outcome of the applications, and especially if they've been living in the UK for a long time. So, but you must also inform them that if they meet the criminality thresholds. Um, one, as I just explained, the application might be referred to immigration enforcement. Secondly, if the deportation test is met, deportation action can be initiated, and because of that, if it, if it, it is initiated, then um, the application under the EU settlement scheme might be refused on suitability grounds. Okay, so all of that needs to be explained very clearly to any applicant that you think um, they met the referral criteria and also in writing, so that the applicant understand the consequences of applying under the EU settlement scheme. Um, in addition, you also must inform them that if the application was submitted on or after Brexit Day, on the 31st of January 2020, and if the application is refused on grounds of suitability, they might be able to challenge that decision in court as they will have a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal. If it's submitted before Brexit Day, they will not have a right of appeal or administrative review if refused on suitability grounds. Again, any refusal on, on grounds of suitability, if you don't have the um, if you don't have the right level of accreditation to help them, you again might need to refer to a more senior immigration advisor. Separately from the USS application, if the Home Office decides to issue deportation proceedings against them or if the USS status is revoked as a, as a result of a deportation decision later on, applications will all, I, sorry, applicants will also have a chance to challenge those decisions by submitting representation and lodging an appeal against the deportation order to the first year tribunal. Again, you might need to refer this case to a more senior immigration advisor if deportation proceedings are initiated against the applicant. Okay, so is 11.05, we have now finished um, the training sessions. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at some case studies. Before that, I would suggest to have a five-minute break. So perhaps we can come back at 11.10, and then we're going to go through two case studies, and then we will open up the discussion, and we have a Q&A at the end of the session. So let's now have a look at some case studies. So this is case study one. We're going to give you now a couple of minutes for you to read the facts of the case. I hope everyone is able to see this slide. We had problems before with the case study slide, so if someone cannot see it properly, don't worry because we're going to summarize the case study anyway after in a couple of minutes. Okay, so have a look and see whether you think that person 
is eligible for settlement status and what are the key issues that he might face applying under the scheme. Okay, so just a couple of minutes. Okay, so I'll just summarise the facts of the case. So Azizi is a dual citizen from Spain and Algeria. He entered the UK in May 2015. He was in regular employment until June 2019 when he lost his job. In August 2019, Azizi had problems with his landlord and he was evicted from his property. He became homeless and has been rough sleeping since then. He has only spent a total of three weeks outside the UK since he moved here in May 2015. He has no criminal convictions in the UK or abroad. Azizi lost his Spanish biometric passport in November 2019 due to rough sleeping on the streets. Since he lost his passport, he has taken steps to obtain a new one from the Spanish authorities. He attended the Spanish consulate in March 2020 but it was told that the Spanish consulate could only issue documents to citizens who are registered with them and that registration in London takes about 10 months to complete. In his case, he was only registered with the Spanish consulate in Algeria and Spain. He was informed that, alternatively, he could apply for a five-day emergency passport. However, in order for the consulate to issue an emergency passport, he had to show that he had booked a flight ticket to Spain or Algeria with the purposes of applying for a permanent passport. Unfortunately, Azizi is unable to travel abroad as he does not have the financial means to cover the costs of a flight ticket and accommodation as he is currently homeless. Azizi has a copy of his lost Spanish passport and an official document from the Spanish consulate confirming that his passport has been lost. Azizi came to your organisation for assistance with his EU settlement scheme application. So the questions, as you can see on the slide, are is Azizi eligible for settled status or pre-settled status? And what are the key issues in this scenario and how can you address them? So starting with, is Azizi eligible for settled status? I think I can see that Mariana and Ludmilla have said yes, he is eligible for settled status. That's correct. And Ludmilla has also said that the key issues will be lack of valid ID and lack of residence evidence from 2019 onwards. This is also correct. So let's now go through the slides. So Azizi should be eligible for settled status because he has lived in the UK for a continuous period of at least five years. He meets the eligibility and suitability requirements and no supervening event has occurred in his case. And in terms of the key issues, we have, as you've already noted in the chat, that Azizi lost his passport while rough sleeping and he therefore does not have a valid ID. And Azizi may lack residence evidence from the period August 2019 onwards as he has been homeless. So in terms of solutions, with regards to the first issue, we know that Azizi has already taken steps to obtain a valid ID, however he's been unable to do so. He was told by the Spanish consulate in the UK that he could only apply for a new passport if he was registered with them and that registration takes 10 months.
They said he could apply for an emergency passport to travel to Algeria or Spain, but he needs to show that he has his flight ticket booked. And this is not possible for Azizi because he does not have the financial means to do this. You should therefore assist him to apply with a paper application form and alternative evidence of his identity. So I can see that a few of you have noted in the chat that he can use his expired passport as alternative evidence of his identity. This is correct. So if we look at the next slide, you can see, yes, that it notes this. He can use his expired passport and he can also provide evidence from the Spanish consulate that his, his old passport was lost or stolen. You can also assist as easy to gather evidence relating to the issues he's had obtaining a new passport, such as guidance from the Spanish consulate about registration and also evidence of his destitution. You can then call the EU Settlement Resolution Centre to request the paper application form and you can write detailed legal representations in support of his application. Yes, and I can see in the chat that Serena has put this last point about detailed legal representations on why he cannot attain a valid passport in the chat. That's correct. It would be useful to submit those with the application as well. So, in the detailed legal representations, you can note Azizi's background, the reasons why Azizi is entitled to apply under the EU settlement scheme using a paper application form and alternative evidence of his identity, you should explain all the steps that Azizi has taken to obtain an ID, the reasons why it is impossible for him to obtain one, and you can state that there are circumstances beyond Azizi's control, so that's the way the Spanish authorities issue passports, and compelling practical and compassionate circumstances in his case, so that's that he is destitute and homeless and unable to travel abroad. And also you can note the reasons why Azizi is eligible for settled status. So now looking at the second issue, which is lack of residence evidence. So from the scenario, it sounds like Azizi's initial four years of residence in the UK may even be registered by the Home Office automatic checks as he was in regular employment from May 2015 to June 2019. However, this will not be the case for the, after this period as he has been homeless and rough sleeping. He is therefore unlikely to possess lots of evidence of his residence from that period onwards. So, as noted on the slide, you could therefore obtain his chain records and, if possible, a letter of support from any homeless organisations that have supported him and can confirm his residence in the UK for that last year of his, his five-year period. You should also go ask Azizi about his situation over the last year in case there are any other forms of evidence residence that you could obtain. So, for example, you could ask him if he's had any medical treatment or been to the GP during this period of rough sleeping. Great, so I think that's case study one complete. And we're now gonna move on to case study two. So if you just take some time again to read through this case study, and again, if you can think of the answers to the questions, is Tobias, in this case, eligible for pre-settled or settled status? And what are the key issues in the scenario and how can we address them? So we'll just give you some time now to read through the scenario. Great, Carla, do you want to summarise the facts? I'll give you the presenter privileges as well. Thank you, Bella. Yes, so just let's uh, go, uh, go through quickly to the facts. So, Tobias is a Swiss citizen. He's a graffiti artist and he is right now homeless and suffers from serious mental health conditions. He entered the UK in January 2013 and has been living here ever since. 
he has a simple social background, has been homeless for years, and he has been through different um, temporary accommodations and been supported by homeless charities since 2013. He has a history of drug and alcohol dependency and also mental health issues. He also suffers from epilepsy. epilepsy. Since 2016, he has been diagnosed. And given his complex background as homeless young man with a chaotic lifestyle, poor living conditions, etc., he has also been arrested several times and been convicted of some minor offences, such as shoplifting and antisocial behaviour. He doesn't remember the full details of his criminal history in the UK. Um, he, think, he thinks he has some criminal convictions, but he only recalls being in prison once for one month in November 19. He has never been issued with the deportation, exclusion or removal decision. He has a Swiss biometric passport in this case and no employment history in the UK. So let me see the chat first to see what people have said. Uh, okay, so Cozy said, subject access request for criminal records. Yeah, that is a very good point. Ludmila said, settle status, issues, lack of resident evidence, mental health issues, criminal records history. I think that it covers almost everything um, because in this case we have a Swiss biometric passport, so there is no issues with a, having a non-valid ID. So let's um, let's see if someone else wants to say anything else about the case. Um, I think that covers most of it actually. So let's go for it. So is to be as eligible for settle or pre-settle? As Ludmila said, he should be eligible for settle status because he has lived in the UK since 2013. He might meet the suitability requirements, like, but it seems that he might meet suitability and eligibility. And no supervening event has occurred in this case. In 2013, he has not left the UK for more than four years, um, as, as he is a Swiss citizen, supervening event is four years. And however, there is a chance that his application might be refused on suitability grounds. And this is why it's important what Cozy said about actually requesting a subject access request to really make sure that we understand the extent of the criminal convictions that he has. So um, let's have a look for the lack of resident evidence. Any suggestion as to what to do about that? I'm going to put the facts here again. So lack of resident evidence. He has no employment history in the UK. What do we do in this case? Do you want to? Do you want to say anything? What would you do? Let's see if someone replies, otherwise I'll go through it. Natalie, chain records, great, if he's in London, and GP plus support letters, perfect. I think in this case, with good GP uh, records and chain records, we should be enough, because we know that he has been supported by homeless charities since at last 2013. Now, providing he's been in London all the time, which we don't think in this fact case, but providing that he has been in London, um, yeah, all these chain records, the chain records will show all these years, at least in 2013. So that would be in itself, that might be enough. But also because he has mental health issues and uh, he suffers from medical conditions, etc. cetera, um, I'm pretty sure that he will have GP records and possibly um, um, hospital letters, etc. So that is very good. Now, second issue, what do we do with the criminal records history? I mean, as we already said, actually, we need to do a subject access request. And I'm gonna explain to you now another issue that can happen. So yeah, Angela said, do an accurate request. In this case, we have his Swiss biometric passport. So no problem of um, proving the identity of Tobias. So we just need to get a copy of it and upload it with our subject access request. We will need to disclose his addresses in the last 10 years. I mean, that is a bit irrational in this case because he's only been in the UK since 2013, so not for 10 years. But again, because he's been through so many various accommodations and he has mental health issues, he might not record all his addresses. So you might want to use his current address and then a stip um, a state in the application that he has been living there for 10 years and then in the box at the end of the application process explain exactly what happened in the case. And there is one more issue that potentially might happen in this case. Does anyone spotting what we need to explain to Tobias that might happen in this case as well? He might be, is it the enforcement because he's been in prison? Yeah. There is a potentiality according to what we find out through the criminal records that he might be in, um, yeah, referred to immigration enforcement. Let's have a look 
this. This we have already covered, okay? Lack of valid residence, um, knowledge of criminal records, and potential referral to immigration enforcement and suitability assessment. Lack of residence evidence, we have covered it together. Um, and again, in this slide, we basically make you aware that even though, I mean, in this case, I think it will be easier to get um, residence evidence because of the facts of the case, but there are other cases that are not that straightforward. So if you find cases that it's very difficult to get five-year residence, but you know because the client has instructed you that they arrived more than five years ago, then do not apply for pre-settled status. Try any way to get him settled status and use whatever you have plus your legal representations explaining why there's gaps in his residence evidence. Okay? And this is because um, settled status is much more is a much more stable immigration status that will entitle Soviets and any other homeless EU applicant to access benefits and other um, and the welfare system in an easier way than if they had pre-settled status. And for them specifically, that is life-changing. So yeah, so in this case, if you are very short in evidence, then make sure that in the, your detailed legal representation you cover why there are so many gaps. In no, there is normally an explanation. Um, we have already covered this. Um, Tobias seems to be unsure about the criminal records. There's a requirement of self-disclosure. So easier thing, make a subject access request if he authorizes you to do so on his behalf or he can do it himself. Now, um, in the last three years, uh, because he, has, he seems to be a persistent offender, um, it could be that in the last three years he received more, uh, more than three or more convictions. It also can be that he had more than one criminal conviction in the uh, prison sentence in the last five years. Actually, he disclosed being in prison once in 2019. So there are some elements in this case that makes you make us think that he might that, that case might trigger a potential referral to immigration enforcement. So if that happens, um, the Home Office then will assess Tobias' case and take into account all his criminal convictions in the UK, as well as any criminal, uh, criminal convictions that he might have in Switzerland, that sometimes actually um, they show up as well in the PNC um, records in the UK. And then um, as part of this suitability assessment, all of that will be taken into consideration. And then a final decision on whether to pursue deportation or not will be subject to a proportionality assessment looking at the particular facts of Soviet life, so not only his criminal convictions, but also how long he's been in the UK. In this case, seems, in this case he's been living here for more than five years, I think eight. Any family links, any mental health issues, any other issues that he might have, et cetera. But the most important here thing here is actually inform the Soviet orally and also by, in writing that there is a possibility that his case might be uh, um, referred to immigration enforcement. You will not know when that happens. And, the, and if after this assessment, the Home Office thinks that his case meets the deportation threshold, he might be issued with a deportation action and with a refusal under the scheme. I think it's quite unlikely in this case because Tobias seems to be like a minor offender with like a quite persistent but with minor offenses. But still, we don't know. We don't know the, how serious is the criminal history. Okay, so that's the end of our training for today. We are now going to move on to a Q&A for those of you who are watching live. For those of you who are viewing this recording at home, thank you very much for watching our webinar. We hope that you found it useful. Please feel free to refer to our detailed training manual if you want to look back at the written solutions to the case studies or refresh your memory on anything you have learned today. Thank you very much and goodbye.